So, but we'd like to welcome you to this gorgeous, beautiful Shabbat morning. We start, or uh, actually begin to conclude uh, the Sukkot celebration and moving into uh, the Sienka Torah and uh, Simon Atarez. Uh, so we'd like to welcome all those who are watching live today by live streaming and uh, those who are on Facebook this morning. Uh, we honor your presence here at Beth uh, and I. Again, I say welcome to everyone. So let's begin with prayer. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who has made us holy through his commandment and commanded us to actively study in Torah. Please, Hashem, our God, sweeten the words of your Torah and our mouths and in the mouths of your people, the house of, of Israel. May we and our offspring and our offspring and offspring and all the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, may all know together that you that your name that you to know to study your name your Torah for the sake of fulfilling your desire. Blessed are you Shem who teaches Torah to his people Israel. Blessed are you Shem our God, King of the universe, who chosen us from all the nations and given us the Torah. Blessed are you Shem, giver of the Torah. Amen. All right. Um, next slide please. Brad, next slide. Uh, so we want to uh, do a, a recap from last week's study on this on the code. Uh, I trust today that you have your Bible in this particular teaching because we're going to look at some uh, a chapter in the, later as we talk about this as we end this discussion on the code and look at the Shemini uh, Therese and uh, Sukkot Semi. I uh, can't get my tongue right today. Uh, Sem Katora. All right. So, next slide. So, we want to use that as our background scripture from out of Leviticus 23, chapter uh, and verses 34 through 36. Uh, it says, tell the people of Israel on the 15th day of this seventh month is the Feast of Sukkot. For seven days to Adonai, on the first day there is to be a holy convocation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. For seven days you are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. On the eighth day you ought to have a holy convocation. The eighth day is what? Sam uh, Therese and Sam Kotora coming up. Uh, and you are to make and bring an offering made by Friday out of night. It is a day of public assembly. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. However, some people in the society we live in seem to be forced to work. So, next slide, please. Uh, as we looked at the recap last week, we looked at, in Leviticus 23, verse uh, 34, 36. We read that the, the, the Sukkot, uh, we know as, it, as well as the Festival of Tabernacles, was to last seven days with a holy convocation on the eighth day, which is also a Sabbath. The eighth day was considered part of the feast, even though it was separately, separate, a separate holiday. Again, it is called Simon uh, Therese, and literally means the eighth conclusion. While it is the conclusion of Sukkot, as well as the fall feast, most importantly, it is the conclusion of the seven Levitical feasts. It also called the Festival of Living Water, and we discussed that last week, uh, as Yeshua uh, declared at that time uh, his Messiahship, uh, because at this time many prayers are sent to God for, for dew and rain prepared to ground, prepare the ground for the seed for the next year's crop. Without this living water, there will be famine and death. It was at that this festival again, Yeshua declared himself to be Messiah. 
and this will be proved before one year would elapse. Yeshua was fulfilling Simeon Torah, not just giving life one year, but giving eternal life forever. Now today our focus will center on the prophecies of Sukkot. And a lot of people never thought about that. But there is a prophecy involved in this Sukkot. And we will discuss at as well as Emmanuel Torres and Sim Kotora. Before moving forward, I want I would like to share a few photos of members of Beth and I on the day one of Sukkot preparing the Sukkah. Uh, next slide. And we have some of our teens in the circle on the first day. Uh, next slide, please. We got, I wish she was here to see this. She usually here. Our mom, she was sitting out there uh, handing out things. Everybody was involved doing something. I had some other pictures I didn't maybe put on uh, that I saw that some of the people's taking care of the food, make, preparing the food. I couldn't get them all on. Russian trying to get through this week. Next slide, please. And that's our uh, Estra and Lou that we Rabbi, Rabbi Rene brought in and took a picture. Next slide, please. And there's some other teens that uh, was involved in it. I, I Asked my wife to bring the teams up and let them see this, but uh, they had the other things they needed to do this morning. So you all let them know they was on slide um, in the part of the teaching this morning. All right, next slide. I think this might be the last one. Okay, thank you. All right, so as we unlock the plan of salvation, uh, the Feast of Tabernacle and the Feast of Sukkot, uh, someone once said, the epitome of true happiness is spiritual fulfillment. The epitome of true happiness is spiritual fulfillment. So, I want you to keep that thought in mind as we journey through this lesson. Uh, this realization of connection to God and life uh, lead for divine purpose is the true secret to happiness. This is as it, it, this is King David's message in these words. Sukkot itself is the time of all joy. It is the season for great rejoicing and it climax is at the water libation. So Dave, King David spoke of that and we talked about that last week. This is the holy day of true faith in the shadow of the divine presence. When the heart is free and open to this experience, the true happiness of spiritual fulfillment actually leads to prophetic enlightenment. The sages teach that the prophecy itself can only come about through joy. A prophet can never receive enlightenment unless he is in a state of joy. For the divine presence itself only rests on one who is joyful. Thus, with regard to the prophet Elisha, the verse states in 2 Kings, Kings 3 and 15, And it came to pass when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. So we're going to look at, as we continue to do this, draw down the spiritual, uh, uh, spirit of prophecy. Uh, meaning, herein lies the true secret of the festival of the water libation, which we talked about on last week again. State that uh, in the Jerusalem Tammuz, the great joy was in the receiving of prophetic inspirations. For the Hebrew word for the drawing of the water is Shah Eva. Also indicate drawing a different direction. 
the drawing down of prophetic enlightenment. Thus, whoever who has never seen the celebration of the festival of the water libraries had never experienced true joy in his life. For it, it was here that the prophet like Jonah, the son of Amathah, received their prophecy. The Jerusalem Tamar relate that, that Jonah was not expected expecting any revelation, but merely arrived at the festival uh, of the water libration, along with all the other holiday pilgrims. He was, all, he was so overcome with joy that he received divine inspiration. And in turn, there can be no greater joy than this. Uh, thus, on the holiday that is predisposed to joy, we find the epitome of true celebration taking place in the hollow courtyard of the Lord. There, his people experienced such spiritual happiness that it, result, that it resulted no less than the high brush with the divine possible for a human being to attain. The prophetic experience all this came about by the fulfillment of the will of God in his presence. That's coming most from the Jerusalem Tamu. Uh, now, so, preparing for the festival. While the actual act of pouring the water on the altar takes place early in the morning, this libation is preceded by the celebration which lasts entire night, each night of Sukkot. Uh, which people all over the world who recognize Sukkot uh, experience. It was amazing to me the, other, the first day of Sukkot coming up to it. I heard one of the news, uh, no, it actually was Rosh Hashanah, excuse me. I heard one of the news uh, anchors before he signed off. He said, so, Happy New Year to those who celebrate. And he left like, like that. I thought that was interesting that he recognized. And a lot of people, I, it caught my attention. I said, oh, that's wonderful that this new guy no, uh, noticed it and said it. Uh, so same thing is with Sukkot. And we're going to get into uh, later why it's so important for all Gentiles and all people of the world to celebrate as we continue to read them, the teaching, rather. So, the actual participant, participant in the celebration were not the common folk, uh, but the greatest scholars and the most pious men of the generation, uh, the hand, uh, the heads of the Sanhedrin, the sages and the academic heads and the elders were the one who pretty much during that time was the one who was in this in this assembly doing it. And you can see the other people looking over, watching them celebrating it for some reason. In the presence of all those assembling in the Holy Temple, th these exceedingly righteous men would dance, sing, and rejoice. All uh, the dancing of the Israel came to watch and listen. There were those among the sage who would even dance while juggling flaming torches. It is uh, related that Rabban Shimon ben Gamal juggled eight such torches, catching them in his hand one at a time without allowing them to touch each other. In utter simplicity, without regard to their own statue or uh, station, they dance in honor of the libation, the holy day, and most of all, to honor the Holy One who has chosen to make his presence known in this house. It was in this same spirit that King David danced before the ark of the Lord. And for your reference on that, you can see Samuel, 2 Samuel 6 and 21. So, happy is our old age. Uh, happy is our youth, brother, and happy is our old age. Uh, 
while the great man danced before the people of Israel, they sang and recited words and praise to God and inspiration to the nation. The very pride men uh, declare, happy is our youth that is not uh, embarrassed as in our old age. These are the saints who have never experienced the taste of sin, whose, live, whose lives have been uh, consistently pure and devoted to the service of Adonai. But the, but the pretense does uh, those who have been led wayward in that youth and have now returned completely to the Holy One with renewed vigor. These one declared, happy is our old age, for it has a tone for our youth. And both groups sang together, happy is he who sang, who, who sinned not, and he who has sinned, let him return and it shall be forgiven. So I'm drawing an image of what they was doing during the time of the Sukkot, of the dancing, uh, all the older and the youth together, uh, dancing with the Torah, dancing for all this uh, celebration of water libation. It was just a time of joy and celebration. All right. While these celebrations were in progress, down on the floor of the woman, women's court, the Levites stood upon the 15th step and that led up from the quarter of the court of Israel. These 15 steps correspond to 15 other steps. The songs of the saints, chapter first, chapters 120 through 134 of the book of Psalms. Normally, the Levite choir stood within the court of Israel, opposite the other outer altar, and facing the entrance uh, to the sanctuary building. A special platform was located near there, just within the Nicanor gates, and the Le Levite stood there and sang every day during the daily sacrifice. But now, at the water library, it was upon uh, these steps that they sang and played with the innumerable musical instruments like harps, lyres, cymbals, and trumpets. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So, uh, of uh, a unique con connection is given to the Gentile as we look at the prophecies of Sukkot. And all of these sacred seasons that God commanded Israel to observe, such as the Festival of Tabernacles, has the strongest implications for the nations of the world. It has the strongest implications for the nation of the world. Even today, vast numbers of Gentiles identify with the holiday of Sukkot and uh, they will ascend on Jerusalem just to be in the Holy City at this time of year. So this is a picture I thought I'd show you of a group of ladies appear to be uh, foreigners uh, going to Israel to celebrate Sukkot. Uh, even today we have some of our members in the land celebrate Sukkot. So we wish them well. I know they uh, probably listen in today, so we say hi to you all. Now, so it, uh, uh, it is as if their heart screens are pulled by some invisible magnet, the source of which they not know. Some force draw, draw them to the connected, connected between Sukkot and to the location of the Holy uh, Temple. This is well understood for it is connection emphasized by both the written scriptures and the oral traditions. The relationship between the nations and the holy day of the cult date back to ancient times and arts through our own period as well. To form a bridge into uh, that future rectified uh, world that we 
all yearn and long for. Jews and Gentiles alike, uh, the day when the Lord and his name will be one. So in Zechariah 14, verses 9, speak of that. Uh, so let's look at another uh, significant thing about uh, Sukkot, uh, which we, we're going to look at the sacrifice of the 70 bulls as a part of the prophecy. During Sukkot, in the time of the Holy Temple, a unique sacrifice was offered on the altar with a unique intention. Uh, in the prophecies of the end days. Uh, chapter 29 of the book of Numbers. Uh, the Bible outlined the sacrifice that are to be offered over the span of the holiday during this particular one. Counting the numbers of bulls that are offered over the seven day period we find that the total number number was 70. And if and in chapter 10 of the book of Genesis, there are 70 nations mentioned. These are uh, the pre-modern nations, sometimes referred to as the 70 languages, which represent all humanity. The Tamu uh, B.T. Uh, Sukkot 55b teaches that the 70 bulls that were offered in the Holy Temple served as atonement for the 70 nations of the world. Think about that for a moment. These particular bulls that was being offered represented the 70 nations of the world. Let that soak in for a moment. Uh, the Holy Temple served uh, as atonement for seven and eight. Truly, as the rabbis deserve, if the nations of the world had only known how much they needed the temple, they would have surrounded it with an armed fortress to protect it. Uh, that's Bar, 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 one and three. Uh, and they would have protected that if they knew all the nations in the world knew what this, what this uh, celebration had uh, uh, foretold or going to be foretold in the future. Here we can already sense that inherent within the very nation of the holy day an uh, uh, inserable bond as expressed through the, its sacrifice requirement links it to the earth people. The coat was mandated by the Creator Himself to be a holy day, holy, holy day for all the world. Not just for the Jewish people, but for all the people of the world. The half tar, the section of the prophet, uh, reads in the synagogue on the first day of the festival, come from the 14th chapter of the book of Zechariah. This prophecy deals with the end of days when the nations of the world will all together uh, will all gather together to do better against Jerusalem at the culmination of this the law will be king over the earth before uh, before continuing it will be most beneficial for the reader to study the entire chapter of the book of Zechariah here is a uh, brief section we want to look at. If you have your Bible, I said earlier, uh, we're going to take a look at this particular chapter. We're going to read this 14th book of Zechariah uh, as it relates to the coming of the Lord. That is a prophecy. Sukkot is designed for that purpose. Uh, God knew what he was doing. It's a, it read, and I, I, if you have your book, Bible, I'm going to read. Uh, you can follow along with me. Behold, a day is coming of the Lord, 
when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses pondered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fight on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies between Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one Half of the mount shall move northward, and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my name, my, my mountains. For the valley of the mountain shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzal, king of Judah. The, then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day there shall be no light, coal, of frost. And that should be a unique day which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night, but even time that shall be light. On the day living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the east side and half of them in the west western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. And the Lord will be king over the earth and on that day, the Lord will be one and his name. What Y'all heard that before every week, right? The whole land shall be returned into a plain from Gabal to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate, the corner gate, and from the tower of Hanel to the king's wine presses and it shall be inhabited for there shall be never again be a decree of early destruction Jerusalem shall dwell in security and this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people that wage war against Jerusalem their flesh will not their flesh will rot, rot while they are still standing on their feet their eyes will rot in their socket and their tongues were rot in their mouth. On the, that day a great panic from the Lord shall fall on them, so that each will seize the hand of another, and the hands of one will be raised against the hand of the other. Even Judah will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be collected, shall be collected gold, silver, and garment in great abundance. And a plague like the plague shall fall on the horses, the mules and camp, the camels, the donkeys, and whatever beasts may be in those camps. Then everyone who survive, on, uh, survive all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to the feast, keep the feast of boots, which is also called Sukkot. Uh, also the Feast of Tabernacles. Those words are interchangeable. And, and if any of the famous families excuse me, of the earth did, do not go to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And, and if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague that which the Lord afflict the nations that do not go to keep the feast of boots. This shall be an, this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go to the, keep the feast of boots. And on that day that shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, and to the pots in the house of the Lord shall be as the bowls bowls before the altar. And every pot, pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of sacrificing them, and there shall be no long, longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. So, 
it's important that we honor Sukkot. Now, all the nations, this is a, a, a holy day that God put in place for all nations. Now, we could do a whole new study just on chapter 14 of Zechariah, but we won't have time. We won't, we won't get into that. But I just wanted you to hear that, that that is a prophecy that had not been fulfilled yet. Thus, we, we see the mark of separation that which will distinguish those who remain after that awesome battle. So the, uh, is the single fact that they will celebrate the holiday of Sukkot and a stern warning issued to those who do not observe it. So it's, it's just imperative that we do it now. Because either you do it now or you do it later. I like the candy now and later. I used to love it when I was a kid. Now I understand why I like it. If you don't do it now, you're going to do it later. It's going to be done. That's, that's the point. So the final judgment uh, and Sukkot is, is a similar thought is echoed by the oral tradition from the Tabu. Uh It relates that in the end of days, all the nations of the world will express a desire to repent, and God will judge them through the commandment of building a circle. Ain't that interesting? He, give, he will give this single commandment to the entire world to fulfill. So, if you, it's a good opportunity for us to practice building a circle during this time. And when it when you come to the time that we with the Lord, you know how to and you understand what you're doing. So it's gonna be a commandment for the entire world to fulfill. Alright? So let's move to the next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So following the seven joyous days of Sukkot, we come to the happy days of Simone Alteria and Sim Katora. In the uh, diaspora, the first day is known by its biblical name, Simone Alteria. We still dwell in the circle, but without a blessing. Use a Zizekar, the memorial of for the departed, is also said on this day. The second day is known as Semkatora, during which we complete and immediately begin the annual Torah reading cycle. So we preparing for that even next week. Uh, here at Beth and I, we gonna be doing the new Torah cycle, and it's going to be di done differently this year for all congregation. It's going to be very exciting. We all excited about it. This joyous milestone is marked with dancing, traditionally following seven circuit known as Hakafata, as the Torah scroll or hell aloft, uh, meaning that this is a time of dancing with the Torah. Uh, but both days are celebrated, celebrated by nightly candle lighting, festival meal at both night and day, and desisting from work. In Israel, the entire holiday is comp compacted into one headed 24 hour period. I mean, they constantly just keep dancing all through the night. So they having a great time now in Israel. That's what this girl. Someone might just bust out and just start singing and dancing, take the uh, tour, just dance all over the place. So that's the joy of it. So I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, on the next slide, uh, how to celebrate uh, this holiday in the best way possible. Uh, again, the half cut I think that's how you say it. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. It's dancing with the Torah. 
uh, is done. And again, it's celebrated on the eve of uh, St. Cotora and then again the following morning. The Hasidic community uh, included, uh, also conducted on the eve of St. Uh, Therese. They start that night. Uh, before sundown, women and girls light candles, bringing in the uh, sanctity of the holiday into their homes and family. St. Couture, which followed the holiday of St. Cope, offers the synagogue services unlike those you've seen on the uh, unlike those you have seen on any other day. Uh, you know, we, we celebrate uh, one other holiday in the spring where we have all the flags and we wave them. But this is this is unlike that. Uh, so we celebrate with the Torah singing, dancing, clapping, snack, uh, just uh, singing. I mean, the, the way they do it is, is uh, just a fantastic way of celebrating the Torah. Unique syncretory services uh, celebrating the completion of the yearly Torah reading cycle are held at night and then during the day. Although there is a, a specific framework to follow, uh, there is a measure of spontaneous, spontaneous uh, joy built into the day. Some people may just break out, again, like I said earlier, into this, uh, spontaneous uh, singing, dancing, and more singing at, at any point throughout the service. Uh, so they would just get up and just start singing and dancing. I mean, it was just a great time. Now, this dance is somewhat different from what uh, you may encounter in other settings. Since there is no instrumental music, singing and clapping are part and, and partial. Uh, of the dances. Jews tend to dance in circles. And we we know how we do it here. So, Dancers may hold the hands of their neighbors, place their hand on the neighbor's shoulder, or simply bounce around in a loose, coordinated, uh, chaotic circle. Someone may grab a hold of you and pull you into the circle of dancing. Now, I remember when I was in Israel, and we was down in uh, at the uh, wall, and just before the Sabbath started, they were dancing. They was grabbing uh, some of us and said, "Come on, dance with us." And we was out there with them. You know, it was it was a lot of fun. But uh, I was like shocked. But come on, they snatch you on in. So this is what they do during this particular time as a coat. Uh, so somebody just grab you and pull you on into the circle. Uh, please don't do that at Bethlehem now to me, because I might, I, I might fall and trip myself. <laughs> Y'all will be laughing. So, so no one is uh, checking to make sure you know the step. They don't care. So, uh, if y'all don't mind, I, a lot of y'all can make be snatched in, and who knows? Who cares if you knew the step? Just do it, right? <laughs> All right. That's to the dancers. All right, so it's all about having fun and rejoicing in the tour. So that's that's what the setting is supposed to be about uh, next week, about dancing and celebrating uh, with the tour. Sometimes when the tour come out, I just see people like, uh, no, be joyful about it. It's a joyful time uh, to do it. Uh, so Simmer Sinclair Morning service thought like ordinary holiday served with verses from Psalm, the Shamar, and it, and his accompanying blessings, and the Amada, uh, which uh, this is this this normally how the service go. Uh, the first abnormally uh, you will encounter is that the priestly breast is here during the counter repetition of the. Al Amadab is doing this sent secret service instead of doing the Musa, Musa as one of the other holidays. Uh, so those things uh, are done. Uh, they bless the congregation with prosperity, uh, divine favor and peace. 
uh, using an ancient formula written in the Torah. Uh, let's see. So, uh, during the actual blessing, they will cover uh, their upper bodies with their prayer shawls, stand up front facing the congregation. It is customary for men to cover their heads with their prayer shawl and for small children to stand underneath their father to leap during the blessing. Uh, that happened in certain synagogues. Uh, following the repetition of the Almadah, many congregations take a little refreshment break before the, the dancing uh, to follow, which is another departure from regular, regular holiday service. And I, I don't know if I was going to be set up in that manner, but that's typically how they do it. Uh, and like before, they wait to hear the kids before uh, tucking in. Like San Quatora night, many congregations will have auctions uh, followed by Again, some old dancing. We had an auction here too. <laughs> uh, but uh, Miss Miss Patty did an auction here. That was a lot of fun. On the block uh, today are the same honor as last night, as well as the number of honors associated with today's uh, special Torah reading. Since people are often parted out, and it's still early in the morning, the dancer may not feel as vigorous as the night before, probably because they're a little tired. <laughs> uh, one major structural difference you may see is that the seven uh, half ta are crammed into just three and a half conservative circuits around the reading uh, t table. Uh, and what we do here, we do, we march in a figure eight, I think seven times around. Uh, so, uh, that, to, that reading for that day is the most elaborate of all the year's reading. Uh, it starts with the three Torah of, uh, removed from the ark. Uh, with, and then we have a the Torah. The basic, basic procedure is that one after another man will be called up by the Hebrew name to read the tab table. But we, we don't particularly do that here, but that's uh, based on how uh, that service is done. Uh, so, the point is that this holiday coming up is going to be a very uh, exciting time to begin the new Torah cycle uh, and to honor the Torah itself. So as we prepare our hearts and mind uh, for next week Torah uh, reading, uh, Torah cycle uh, and celebration, keep that in mind that it is a joyful time for all of us. All right? Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for an opportunity to come before your people again as we prepare our, our spirit and our hearts for a new Torah cycle, a time of rejoicing, a time of celebration uh, for the Torah that you had given us. And we thank you for this time of your people all over the world who have their heart and mind focused on this time of celebration. We give praise even today as we prepare our hearts and minds uh, for this service. We pray for the ones who bring forth the word today. We give you the praise right now. That the Holy Rukaka, that the Holy Spirit be in our midst. We thank you in the name of Yeshua. We pray. Amen. <laughs>